Let us pray. Grant, O Holy Spirit, that these human words may be for us the word of God this morning. Amen. Amen. I'll admit that I'm one of those people who doesn't like to see Christmas decorations up until after Thanksgiving. But I have to say that this year, this year I was so glad to see the Christmas decorations go up after Halloween and take the place of all those yard signs. <laughs> yes, no, this candidate, that candidate, you all know what I mean. Actually, three years ago, shortly after I ended my time here at Indian Hill Church, I served as a mentor to a newly ordained clergy person up in Springboro. That was quite a hike, a bit more of a commute than up Drake Road, like this morning. But I quickly figured out that instead of going the fastest way up 75, I could go up 71, exit early, and take a lovely drive along country roads. And so that's what I did on Sunday mornings, making my way to St. Francis Springboro. But it happened to be, as you might know, a presidential election year. And boy, was there a lot of reading material for me <laughs> along those country roads. You can imagine Trump, Biden, the local school board, whatever. But there was one sign that I delighted in twice on the way there, the way back, every Sunday. A big sign that said, Jesus for President. <laughs> Jesus for President. Whether we like it or not, and ushers, you might need to man the doors. <laughs> I'm going to talk about politics. <laughs> Jesus for President. Now, obviously, Jesus did not run for president. And the truth of the matter is, he didn't run for king. But it was today, it was for very political reasons that Pope Pius XI established the Feast of Christ the King. Every year, we circle around to this. It's our last Sunday after the season of Pentecost, Right before Advent, we remember Christ the King. In 1925, this feast day was established. It's relatively new, less than 100 years old, unlike our observances of Easter or Christmas that have been going on for centuries. He established the feast of Christ the King, looking around at the world and seeing all the pomp, the circumstances, the power, the politics, the rise of fascism and Nazism, and he wanted Christians to remember exactly who their, their authority was. Christ, not all these other powers or principalities, was their ultimate source of authority. Christ was their king. And so we, as the church, circle round every year to this Sunday to remember who reigns in our lives, in our hearts, in our world. Now, as I said, Jesus didn't run for president. He didn't run for king. He never even called himself king. The titles we give for Christ, for Jesus, like Christ, or the Messiah, or the Anointed One, all of those came later, came much later as titles that we gave Jesus. He never called himself king, but he did. He did call himself, he did preach, teach, constantly talk about and live out the kingdom of God. First and foremost to all of what he was proclaiming in his life and witness was about this kingdom where all were included. He used many images, the banquet where there's a seat for everyone, where all are welcome. 
where all belong. Now, as you know, as you remember, the people of Israel had a long history with kings. It all started out with God wanting to just make a covenant with a people, no go-betweens. God sent the judges as a kind of interim measure, but they begged, they begged God to give them a king. And so eventually God did, and there was Saul, and Saul was, for all intents and purposes, a disaster. Along came David with great hope. His was not exactly a clean slate either, though a little bit better, and his son Solomon. And David and Solomon's years, their reigns, were looked at as the kind of glory years for Israel. And that it was all downhill after that. Their sons vying with each other, battles, wars, oppression, persecutions, and so on and so on. Eventually, the kingdom, both Judah and Israel, fell, and they were off into exile. Now, along the way in this time, God sent prophets, prophets who were trying to get them in line. A great example today is reading from Ezekiel, and right before this, right before this, God, through the prophet Ezekiel, has castigated all of these kings, shepherds who hadn't taken care of their sheep, shepherds who had instead starved them. And so we hear God coming through Ezekiel and saying, I myself, I myself will be your king. God would like to give up on the whole thing because the king thing didn't work out. Fast forward, Jesus and his time. You've heard it before, I'm sure, that the people were expecting that king, the Messiah, who would be a military general, who would help them conquer the Romans. True, there was King Herod, but he was a puppet of the Roman state. They expected a king, a messiah, and they got Jesus, the guy that entered Jerusalem on a donkey, whose crown was made of thorns, who died on a cross. They got Jesus instead. Many of his followers wanted him to be the king up until the very last minute, wanting him to save, save them, from the Romans, but they got Jesus on the cross instead. Now in our lectionary, those are our readings that we use on Sunday mornings, we're on a three-year cycle, and the other two years, not today, last year and next year, we have Jesus returning in our liturgical can calendar to Holy Week. First of all, in one of our years, we hear of him before Pilate, that point when Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, you say that I am. In another year, we have Jesus on the cross with that crown of thorns. And then this, this year, curiously, we have Matthew 25, a very different look at our king. What do we have to learn from this? We know, we know Matthew 25 is the foundational statement, mission statement of almost every Christian nonprofit. In the name of one of them here in, in Cincinnati, Matthew 25. How does it inform our lives as servants, subjects of our King Jesus? Well, I think the king, as the king comes and recognizes and separates out the sheep and the goats, one of the most remarkable things is that those people themselves didn't know, didn't know which camp they belonged in. They didn't know when they were serving others, they were serving their king, that they were serving Jesus. 
I think that's a reminder to us. First of all, we don't earn our salvation. We don't look at this text and go, okay, I'm going to go out and, and I'm going to serve the poor one day out of the week and that'll earn my place in the kingdom. In fact, it's just who they are when they see the stranger, when they see the homeless person, when they see and they hear that they know of nothing else to do but to serve, to clothe the naked, to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty. It's who they were. Now another thing about this story that's really important, and none of those Christian nonprofits, for some reason, don't put the beginning of this reading, the last judgment, into their mission statements. The separation of the sheep and the goats. And that comes to us as a reminder who separates, who judges. It is God. In this story, it is the king. It is not our job to judge others. That is God's work alone. So easily in this world, especially in these days, these divisive times, Obviously, I'm the sheep. The other person is the goat. We are constantly judging others. That's not our job. That's not our job. That is God's work alone. God saves. God judges. We just faithfully do the best we can. Now, what is our job, which is absolutely Jesus' command to us and all his witness, not simply as king, is the command to love. You know, Jesus never commanded us to agree with each other. That's very good news. <clears throat> but he did command us to love. And so, in this story, this parable of a king, sorting out the sheep and the goats. We see the king who is to rule our lives as we serve others, as we refrain from judgment, and as we relentlessly love. That yard sign, Jesus for president. It's kind of fun to go there, isn't it? To think maybe of Peter as the vice president, for James and John, vying, of course, over who gets to be chief of staff. I don't know how he'd address today's issues. I don't really even know much about kings, to be honest. I hear that, or have heard on the news, that in Tibet they're trying to restore the monarchy. They're not always oppressive. And of course, we witnessed a uh, once in the lifetime uh, event, potentially, uh, in England over the past year with the coronation of a king. But I'll let Simon talk to you about that. <laughs> Today invites us to ask, ask, what rules our lives? What reigns? Is it the powers that be? Is it our side versus their side? Or money or success? This is our annual opportunity to be reminded that we are not Democrats or Republicans or Independents. We're not even primarily citizens of the United States, but citizens of the kingdom of God. And our sovereign, our king, is Jesus. Let's keep that in our mind and hearts in the coming weeks. In just a few weeks, we'll be singing. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Just who is that king? How can we invite that king into our lives? As we continue to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen.